Members, order. We now move on to questions to the Minister for Finance. I call Mr. Colin McGrath to ask the first question. Mr. McGrath. Number one, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Good progress has been made to deliver the NDNA civil service reform commitments. The Executive formed its subcommittee on response to RHI inquiry and reform in March 2020. It has met in late July and last week and is currently working to complete the Executive's response to the RHI inquiry. A revised civil service code code of, uh, of code of ethics has been developed, including discussions with trade unions and civil service commissioners. This will be finalised soon and become part of all civil service contracts of employment. It has significant changes in terms of working for the executive as a whole on record keeping, on raising and responding to concerns that are raised either internally or externally. Review of arms length bodies is underway with stage one complete. And I'm discussing with the executive colleagues the creation of a civil service reform team in DOF, which will develop a wider reform plan. The procurement board will be reconstituted to include expert advisory panel appointed from key sectors in the economy. And I will consider last week's NIAO report on civil service capacity and capability and its potential for a read across the civil service reform. Mr McGrath. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, that report that you refer to, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on civil service capacity, highlighted major structural problems with the local civil service. How can we possibly address these challenges without a head of civil service? And can you tell us, when is this appointment going to be made? Well, quite a lot of the work that I've just outlined has been conducted without the head of a civil service. So the world doesn't come to an end without somebody in the head of civil service post. Uh, and a lot of work uh, continues on through the departments and through the executive office itself. Of course, I would like to see uh, a head of civil service appointed soon. I know the First and Deputy First Minister are looking at steps in terms of interim appointments, and I think they want to look at the whole role of the head of the civil service. Uh, and obviously, it will be up to them to bring forward that process. Mr. Philip McQuiggan. Uh, Minister, can I ask, uh, will a review of the recruitment process for senior, sub senior civil servants be part of the reform process? Yes, I think there are, there are a range of issues to be uh, uh, reviewed in terms of civil service reform. Uh, it's a very significant piece of work, and that's why I'm putting together a reform team so that they can scope out the broad areas uh, and do some consultation uh, with other uh, departments and, uh, and executive ministers and others in terms of, of the full scope of issues that we want to see in civil service reform. But it was very clear commitment in NDNA to do this piece of work. Uh, it falls largely to my own department who have responsibility for civil service, uh, and we're happy to have it as broad as, as considered necessary. Mr William Humphrey. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer so far. In relation to the Northern Ireland Audit Office recent reports in terms of capacity and capability and attendance at civil service employment, can I ask the Minister how does his department plan to take forward the recommendations or is he going to take forward the recommendations as put forward by the Comptroller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland in those reports? Well, clearly we'd be looking at them. We have initiated a process of reform in terms of civil service. We're putting together a group uh, to take that forward uh, and clearly this report fits in. Uh, to that discussion. So, uh, of course, there will be recommendations in that report which will be required to be addressed as part of a response to your own committee uh, and indeed to the Assembly as a whole. Uh, and I'm sure the Department will look at that, but it will dovetail nicely with uh, what, what we intend to do in terms of civil service reform as we had agreed under NDNA. Mr. John Blair. I have been concerned that the Treasury's eligibility criteria for its schemes have excluded some businesses, and I have raised this directly and repeatedly with Ministers in London. In particular, given the local restrictions the Executive put in place in October, I call on the Treasury to immediately make furloughing available for all businesses that needed it. I do recognise, however, there was a gap for those businesses not eligible before the 1st November extension of the scheme. But this sort of wage support can only be put in place by Treasury. Firstly, the scale of the funding required is huge. Uh, and Ulster University previously estimated the total value of furlough claims in the North up to the end of July alone was £890 million. This is beyond the scope of our budget locally. And secondly, making these sort of payments requires access to HMRC taxpayer data and systems which we don't have nor could we get. That said, I will continue to use all the levers at my disposal to support businesses impacted as they did most recently in putting the localised restrictions support scheme in place, paying double the amounts available under the London Government scheme. Mr. Blair. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister provide an update on the number of applications and the number of payments in progress on the localised restriction support scheme? Yes, uh, the, uh, the number of applications I think is in the region of 12,000. The number of payments is over 5,000, and I think there are in the region of over 2,000 have been rejected, so more than half of them have been processed, and we're heading towards £20 million in terms of payout on that scheme. Mrs Rosemary Parton. Minister, I thank you for your answer so far. Minister, can you tell me what was the outcome of the talks with the Department of Economy officials over the weekend with regards to this matter, and could you ascertain why it has taken nearly eight months to come up with the appropriate package? Well, the member will know herself, because her own colleague proposed the restrictions last Thursday, that we were not aware until Thursday that uh, non-essential retail uh, was part of the proposition from the Department of Health uh, to be restricted. So in order to come up with a package to address these issues, you have to know where the businesses are that need support. Uh, and so in, this, in essence, we had over the weekend to come up with a package, and that's what we did. Uh, and I brought to the Assembly yesterday a very substantial support package across a range of departments, including the Department of the Economy, to provide that level of support. The amount of funding available to us has changed. The furlough scheme has changed at very short notice. We only knew about just over two and a half weeks ago we had an additional £400 million. And the restrictions themselves have changed the businesses which have been required to be closed. And all of that has happened with very little notice. So the, you know, the, the, the notion that we somehow have had months to come up with these schemes, I wish we had. I wish we had known what restrictions would be in place. I wish we had known what funding was going to be available to us. I wish we had known that the Treasury was going to abruptly change its mind in relation to furloughing uh, with, with no notice. Uh, and I'm looking forward to finding out tomorrow what's actually going to be in our budgets for next year uh, when the comprehensive spent review is finished. So it hasn't been ideal in terms of planning, uh, but we've put together schemes and, and uh, processes as quickly as we could once we had all the relevant information. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Realising just that we are working as this money comes out and tries to get out to businesses, I was wondering is there a possibility that support that was announced yesterday for company directors um, could be utilised by these small businesses? Well, the, uh, the member will know that the, the uh, scheme that that uh, refers to has been taken forward by the Department of the Economy. Uh, and clearly it's to try and address a, a section uh, of our business community who have been not received any support so far and have made the point many times that as we now get on to perhaps the third level of support for some businesses that it, it's, it's particularly acute for those who have not received any support to date. So the Department for the Economy will roll out that scheme. I am looking forward to seeing the details of that and I'm sure if it can assist some of the businesses he's referring to then it would be of benefit to them. Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, question number three. Security of supply is a fundamental in all public sector contracts. It's essential that commissioners continually monitor and assess the resilience of supply chains as COVID-19 continues to impact demand and production in the manufacturing sector. Security of supply will also be impacted by EU exit if the British government fails to secure a trade deal with the EU. I plan to appoint an expert advisory panel from industry to bring fresh thinking on procurement matters and advise the procurement board of, board of the lessons learnt during the pandemic to help build the resilience of government supply chains. Mr O'Dowd. I uh, thank the, the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware of, of many small and medium enterprises uh, who were capable of responding to the shortages of PPE and other equipment in the health sector but weren't able to because they were disadvantaged because of the scale of the contracts. Will the procurement board and the new procurement board ensure that there is a mandatory provision for social value as well as value for money? Well, I think, uh, in my perspective, obviously the procurement uh, board and, and procurement of contracts generally had to follow a set of criteria, but I think clearly the experience of the pandemic, pandemic is such that security of supply has to be key, where previously I, I think price was the king in relation to procurement. Uh, and I think quite clearly uh, the evidence during the pandemic was that there are there is sufficient uh, capacity and skill and ingenuity in local manufacturing uh, to meet some of the critical supply that is necessary for us on this island uh, and, and, and certainly in terms of food in terms of pharma in terms of manufacturing uh, that critical uh, supply exists here so i think that some of the lessons that we have to learn right across 
the island, and between these islands, uh, as a consequence of this, is that you know cheaper price, cheaper goods on the other side of the world uh, may be fine in terms of saving some money, but they don't bring you that security of supply, nor do they assist uh, the local economic growth uh, in the way that procurement should be tailored towards doing. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from that, and I look forward to the newly constituted procurement board uh, getting stuck into that issue very quickly. Mr. Jim Allister. The Minister will be aware of the recent uh, exposed scandal of the obscene amounts of money paid to middlemen in respect of the obtaining of PPE. Can the Minister assure the House that the PPE acquired for and within Northern Ireland was free from any of those payments of obscene amounts of money? Yes, uh, it was officials who dealt with the, the, uh, the, the uh, contracts in China. I was speaking to one of them who was amused at the amount of money that was received by someone else when he was doing it as part of his public service uh, to us and, and did a remarkable job. And, you know, with the focus that had been on the, the first attempt at PPE here, it, it pales into insignificance when you see the obscene amounts of money the British government were prepared to pay to middlemen to achieve this. So, uh, of course, there was a, a, if, I wouldn't say it was a panic, but there certainly was a great degree of urgency in securing PPE, and we were not alone uh, in, in trying to uh, source material in the Far East. And, and that added to complications. It added to cost, undoubtedly, but it also added to complications in terms of access and that goods. And it goes back to the original question from my colleague, Mr. O'Dowd, about security of supply, about knowing your suppliers, about having easy access to them being as important as the cheaper price that sometimes comes from the Far East. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, does the Minister agree with the interpretation of the House of Lords that the protocol suggests that when it comes to security of supply for those supplying key sectors such as health will be subject to EU regulations rather than the will of the executive? Well, I think that remains to be seen. Uh, and of course, there's a great degree of uncertainty in relation to the whole Brexit issue. And there is uh, legislation currently going through the House of, uh, the House of Parliament. Uh, the Lords have taken a particular view on it. I, I'm, I'm told, or I, I, I know from reading commentary on it, that the, the Commons intend to, to take a different view in relation to it when it comes back to them for, for further uh, processing through the legislative framework. All of it is unsatisfactory as far as we are concerned. Uh, I'm sure as far as he is concerned as well. We should not be in this position a couple of weeks away from the exit date. Uh, and you know, this mess is not of our creating. It's certainly not of the creating of the democratic wishes of the people in this part of the world, uh, but it's not of our creation in terms of that negotiations and the process that's developed between the British government and the EU. And the sooner it is resolved with a great degree of clarity, then the better for all of us. Ms. Rachel Woods. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far, but secure, security of supply will also be impacted by climate breakdown. So can I ask the Minister, with regard to procurement processes and policies going forward, if any environmental and climate impact will be reflected to ensure policy is sustainable? Will, for example, a sustainability clause or criteria be considered for security of supply? Well, uh, uh, clearly one of the first issues, I suppose, if, if you're not transporting goods from the far side of the world, there certainly is an environmental benefit. Uh, from having goods produced locally in this island or within these islands. It certainly cuts down on transportation costs uh, for them. Uh, but yes, I, I'm, I'm happy to have a look at all of the issues that she's raised and ensure that the Procurement Board, when it's examining these issues, uh, considers all of those matters going forward. Mr. Matthew Tull. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister be more specific about uh, issues relating to security of supply um, caused by Brexit and have any um, uh, orders been taken forward to um, uh, forestall the uncertainty around the 31st of December. Could the Minister also briefly give us an update on whether he has made any specific allocations or been asked to make any specific allocations in relation to procurement of a vaccine, which we all hope is uh, closer than we once feared? Once feared, <laughs> excuse me. Well, in relation to the, the first uh, question, uh, the, uh, there is a, a huge uh, uncertainty in relation to uh, what our future trade and relations are, are, are going to be like, and that could uh, challenge very significantly the security of supply. Uh, and so we, we need to bottom out all of those issues. And uh, as of yet, the executive is still fairly much in the dark in relation to how this is eventually going to, f to fall down, uh, because the British government has not, uh, not been keen to share information with anybody outside of its own uh, narrow confines. Uh, 
In relation to the vaccine, uh, I'm advised by the, the Minister for Health that the vaccine will be procured centrally in, in the British government system and, and be supplied to us, but although the, the rolling out of a vaccination programme, the logistics of that, uh, will be a matter for the executive to meet the cost of. Dr Steve Aiken. Question number four, please. Uh, RHI disciplinary proceedings are ongoing and I await their determinations. Dr. Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for the Minister's uh, rather short reply. Um, I wonder whether the Minister will be considering introducing legislative changes to ensure that those civil servants or those employed by public bodies who have been subject to disciplinary process but have sub subsequently retired and are therefore under the current legislation exempted from sanction. Can they be prevented to being re-employed as consultants, on boards, or any other, in any other official capacity? Well, can I say outside of the RHI process, because he knows that is ongoing, and he knows it affects a certain number of individuals, so to get into speculation about what they may do or may do in the future, I think, is, is, is something that we do not wish to get into until that process has run its course. But in general terms, I think he, he does make a point which I think is worth looking at, and that is if, if someone is subjected to a disciplinary process then beyond their term in public service, uh, what functions they can, they can uh, uh, avail of or not avail of, as the case may be, depending on the outcome of any such investigation. And I think that's something as part of the re review and reform of civil service that we would want to address. Mr. Declan Mahalair. Uh, Graham Mogut, can the Minister tell us when the Executive uh, Subcommittee on the R RHA recommendations will uh, conclude its work? Thank you. Well, the RHI Subcommittee met last week uh, and processed further the, uh, some of the issues that we've been dealing with in terms of the ongoing work to uh, codes. Uh, it is our intention to bring that to the Executive uh, in December for uh, approval and clearance before Christmas recess. Uh, question number five, what stands in my name, has been withdrawn. Mr Blair, were you rising in your place in relation to question four? Mr Blair. Thank you very much indeed, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, in relation to that, can the Minister provide an update on the panel that was due to be set up uh, following H RHI to investigate ministerial conduct? Well, the setting up and the formation of that panel is responsibility of the Executive Office, uh, and I am hoping that that is taken forward uh, as a matter of urgency. It's an incomplete part of, of the, the process that we've been dealing with from the Department of Finance and the RHI Executive Subcommittee. Uh, so I will be bringing that to the attention of the Executive, because when we do bring the propositions to the Executive for completion in December, uh, clearly we want to see that panel in place as well. Mr. Trevor Lum. Much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, just going back to the question of discipline, uh, the last case I can remember of a civil servant being disciplined was quite a serious one, and the punishment was a letter being placed in his file for 18 months, uh, so he wasn't hung. The, with, with the question of official or semi-official appointments after retirement not depend to some extent on the severity of the offence and the punishment? Yes, I think that quite clearly if, if, if there was a misdemeanour of some sort, uh, then it, it would depend on, on the level of judgment attached to that. Uh, I think the, the question that uh, Dr Aiken posed, I think, has, has outlined uh, somewhere that, that I think would want to be looked at in terms of that. Uh, I'm not sure that there is clear policy in relation to that or an, an analysis of what level of misdemeanour would, would merit uh, what particular uh, disbarment from future uh, appointments or future roles in, in public life. Uh, I, I think this is something that does pertain in other jurisdictions uh, in these islands, so I think it certainly is something that we would want to look at, as I say, setting aside the whole RHI experience. And it's not in, in relation to what is going on there, but in general terms, I think there, there, would, there would want to be policy in, in relation to that uh, for, for civil service and ongoing public appointments. Question number five, which stands in my name, has been withdrawn. Mr Stuart Dixon. Question number six. On the uh, 23rd uh, of November yesterday, the executive agreed allocations of 338.1 million of the 500 million that was held centrally. There is also 150 million set aside for consideration of longer term rate support. A further 26.6 million has been held in reserve in case there are further requirements later in the financial year. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Thank you Minister, for your answer. Minister, you are responsible for assessing bids which come from other departments and then issuing that funding. 
It is therefore incumbent on you to ensure that that money is spent, spent well and spent before the end of the financial year. Given the lateness and lack of ambition of other ministers, what action is your department taking to ensure that money that is bid from you and approved by you is being spent appropriately? Well, firstly, there is a clear understanding, and there has been a clear understanding among executive ministers and departments when they are asked to submit bids, and that is how the process works. Uh, that this money is COVID-related money. It is to be spent in the financial year. It is to be directed to the bro three broad pillars uh, of, of the executive response to COVID, which is supporting vulnerable people, supporting the health service, and supporting business, uh, and, and that it meets uh, those uh, criteria. Uh, and uh, clearly, as I say, we would be obliging departments to come forward and demonstrate that they this is the area they wanted to spend and that they fully understood the requirement to have this spent out by the end of the financial year. So we will continue to, continue to monitor that. There, of course, you will know there will be the January monitoring of the general departmental spend coming through as well. And there may well be further uh, Barnet consequentials received early in the new year. It has been uh, a challenge to manage all of that money and that additional money and, and uh, deal with, the, I suppose, the stripped-down resource available to the civil service because of the pandemic. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it is incumbent on us to make sure that that is spent, spent wisely in the right areas and spent out before the end of the financial year. Ms. Gemma Tolan. Minister, has the British government responded to your request and the request of the Brit of the? Scottish and Welsh finance ministers um, for greater flexibility to ensure the funding is spent fully and effectively this financial year? Well, there have been ongoing discussions with Treasury uh, uh, right up to recent days. I intend to speak to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury tomorrow. Uh, as, as the member may know, the, uh, we are expecting an announcement on the comprehensive spent review tomorrow, which might give an indication of the uh, finances available for next year's budget. Uh, but yes, we have pressed consistently for flexibility, uh, and particularly uh, if, if we are to receive further Barnet consequences early in the new year. I think that, that adds to our case uh, that you know, this, this kind of drip feed uh, of money with, with no long-term planning attached to it uh, is very difficult for any devolved administration to manage. Uh, and I suppose it reinforces that, that point that we have been making in general terms about the need for flexibility in terms of managing the public finances. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Let me, Speaker, I'll be brief. Um, uh, following the spending review, which we expect tomorrow, uh, will the Minister give the Assembly an update on exactly where we are with uh, unallocated new Barnet consequentials so that we are able to better scrutinise uh, where uh, the finances are at this critical time? Well, I, 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 uh, as I say, we, we hope to receive that tomorrow. That's the date we've been given. I have a, a, a a uh, call scheduled with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury tomorrow, uh, and I anticipate knowing that. And of course, I'm happy to come back uh, in terms of when we get a handle on that. We, it, there, there have been a series of budget discussions with other executive ministers. Uh, there's a couple still outstanding because of other businesses overtaking it, and we need to get uh, discussing that with them. Uh, and we understand what the budgetary requirements are of the departments for next year. But of course, that will depend on the amount available to us. So I'm happy to update the Assembly and indeed his own committee when we get some uh, answers in relation to all of that. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, number seven, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Executive's public procurement policy requires public bodies to process procurements under a service level agreement with CPD or a, a re relevant uh, COPE COPE uh, to provide a coordinated and strategic approach to securing best value for money. Recognising that it can be more cost effective for public bodies to carry out their own procurement of low value goods and services. The service level agreements allow for public bodies to do this if they use established procedures that maintain accountability and transparency in expenditure decisions. Mr. Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Uh, a school in my constituency had to pay hundreds of pounds and wait weeks for a simple window, window repair to be carried out because they had to go through the central provider for all schools in Northern Ireland. The principal could have hired a local independent contractor to do it for 75 per cent cheaper and have it repaired the next day. And this does seem to be a problem for many public sector organisations, not just schools. Um, would the Minister consider uh, changes for small-scale expenditure in these areas? 
Well, as I said in my answer, there is a level at which there can be a degree of discretion. Of course, there has to be accountability for all of these arrangements, and, and you know, we need to make sure that uh, work that is provided by certain contractors is up to the standard required for, for a school or for any other public building, because it has to serve that uh, building for some time to come. Uh, so, of course, there have to be standards applied, and there has to be a level of accountability and transparency in terms of how you spend that money, so it's not going to some favoured contractor or supplier. Uh, I'm not making any reference to the school that you're uh, mentioning in this at all, but in general terms it doesn't do that. So, of course, it has to be that balance between making sure that this is good value for money, that it can be got locally if it's below a certain level, and, and that the person or company who supply that have a certain standard that they can adhere to, uh, and, and that that is recognised by the procurement people. Mr William Humphrey. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Like the the member for North Down, I agree in terms of the issues as a school governor. I have had to face similar uh, situations. Can I ask the minister, in the light of the protections that he's talked about in terms of value for money for the Northern Ireland taxpayer, can I ask the minister, does he believe that the uh, Central Procurement Directorate actually provides value for money for Northern Ireland PLC? Well, uh, uh, when we were discussing this question, I, I actually, as an elected representative, I anticipated where the question was coming from and the people perhaps in uh, procurement uh, are anticipating wider issues. And I know, uh, as I'm sure all of you have got frequently, we're told, uh, you know, this could have been got for much cheaper than it was got if you only went to a local supplier. And, uh, I, I get all of those arguments, of course, uh, as, as a locally elected representative and uh, want to ensure that government spend assists our, our local economic uh, growth. Uh, of course, it, uh, procurement and all other agencies have to, have to present value for money uh, in their existence, and we, that's, we have, uh, as I say, initiated a series of changes to the procurement board. Uh, we're bringing in more expertise from outside agencies, and uh, the policies of the procurement that are followed are obviously agreed by the executive, so it's an executive-wide uh, ownership in terms of procurement policy, uh, and the responsibility of that board will be to bring policies to the executive for approval, uh, and I think that's where a lot of these issues can be interrogated, but of course we want to ensure that, as with everything in terms of public expenditure, that it does represent value for money. Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Minister. Uh, again, Minister, you'll appreciate that some of the very best local procurement will be done through social enterprises. What action has your department taken because you have already promised some social value legislation for Northern Ireland? How quickly can we see that on the statute book, and will it happen within the life of this Assembly? Well, on the, in the first meeting and the next meeting that, that uh, I will have with the newly constituted procurement board, social value is one of the main items on the agenda. Uh, and I'm, like yourself, I am very much of the view that uh, social value not only provides excellent value for money, social value at enterprises and projects, but then they have that added value in terms of what they do for people in the community who might otherwise not be employed, uh, or, or the, just that added level of contribution that they make to our society as well as our economy. So I'm a very keen advocate for it. Of course, it has to measure up in terms of value for money, uh, but I believe from uh, my experience, and I'm sure from your own, that it can do that in many, many ways. So we want to see social value being very much part of the procurement makeup. Uh, and if there is time, we've been looking actively at the idea of legislation. Of course, we have a limited time left in the mandate for initiating legislation, taking it right through to its final phase. Uh, but if there is time, uh, I'm certainly willing to look at that. A question from Mr George Robinson and an answer from the Minister. No room for others. Mr Robinson. <clears throat> Can the Minister give assurances that reducing the number of product workers as soon as possible <clears throat> given an e e economic boost to, to the economy of Northern Ireland? <clears throat> Yes, of course. I, I think it, it goes back to this discussion in relation to how, how we spend our money. Uh, and I'm up firmly of the view that we should be spending it as locally as we can to support local businesses and workers uh, and, and to support the local economy. And that's why when I was speaking yesterday publicly in relation to the High Street Voucher Scheme that his colleague is proposing that I'm encouraging, we should be encouraging uh, families to spend that and local businesses to try and use that money to support our local economy. So I think anything we can do in terms of our public procurement uh, or what a, a, a executive departments are doing with, with three billion, I think, in terms of uh, annually that the departments spend, then that has the potential of making a very real impact on the local economy and it should be used in that regard. Thank you. That ends the period for listed questions. We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Mr George Robinson. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. 
And uh, can I ask the Minister on a very, very topical question? To ask the Finance Minister in relation to the localised restriction support scheme, how many allocations have been made and how much finance has been paid out? Well, in relation to my, the, my own scheme, uh, uh, the Department of Economy would have to answer to theirs. Uh, my own scheme, which is administered through LPS, which deals with, uh, with businesses which have a, a, a premises which has, has been uh, closed down due to restrictions. Uh, the, there have been 12,000 applicants. Uh, over 5,000 businesses have been paid out, uh, almost to the value of £20 million. Pounds, and there have been about 2,500 applicants have been rejected. Some of those have come in for the wrong scheme, if you like, uh, that, that hear that there's money available for a certain uh, business sector and think that that's where they go, but actually they don't have a business premises and they, they need to go into the Department for the Economy scheme. Uh, so there's quite a lot of crossover between the schemes and people coming on the wrong ones, or perhaps even people applying to both, making sure they get in on one of them. Uh, and so that, that's how this has been rolling out. But of course we want to see it uh, gather pace as quickly as it can, but as I say, up in £20 million pounds has been paid out to date. Mr Robinson, for a supplementary. The Minister, and what, what proportion is still to be allocated, Minister? Well, uh, as I say, there have been 12,000 applicants, so, uh, and, and judging by those figures, more than half of that has, has been, more than either, half of those have either been paid out or have been rejected. Uh, and so what I want to see is that, that those figures are increasing daily uh, as some of the data issues which, which affected the scheme early on have been, have been ironed out, uh, and so those figures are, are updated. And so bear in mind from the end of this week, we're now introducing a new element, that is the non-essential retail, which puts additional pressure on LPS. So I would like to see as many of these, and that's what we've been asking the department for, as many of these paid out before that uh, additional element to be paid out comes in. Ms. Emma Sheeran. Uh, Minister, can you confirm when people who have a civil partnership currently will be able to convert that into a marriage? The Marriage and Civil Partnership uh, Northern Ireland No. 2 regulations, which introduced the ability to convert uh, same-sex civil partnerships into marriages and opposite-sex marriages to civil partnerships, comes into operation on the 7th of December 2020. There will be no fee for signing the conversion declaration in the first year. Monsieur. Thank you, Minister, and thanks for uh, confirming that you're going to waive the fee uh, for the first year, given that many people who have a civil partnership uh, currently would have maybe preferred a, a marriage if they'd had the choice at the time. Will that fee be, uh, will that waive be extended? Well, I think in the first year, uh, anyway, it, it is to apply. And of course, this is an issue which has been uh, a, a very uh, key issue for some of the people involved in this who ha haven't had been able to have that legally recognised. I think it's a great advance that that is now the case. Uh, there is uh, no, as I say, no fee for signing the conversion declaration in the first year. Councils may apply additional fees for attendance of a registrar at an approved venue, uh, and the General Register Office will bring forward legislation to set the fee for years two and three, so we will be able to have a look at that at the time, see what the take-up is like, uh, if, if the payment of the fee becomes a barrier to such things, uh, and make an assessment then as that comes forward. Ms Sinead Bradley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Minister, yesterday in this House you advised of the £95 million high street voucher scheme. Can I ask you, ahead of that announcement, what checks did you, as Finance Minister, make to make sure that money actually reaches the high street and is not swallowed up by national or multinational organisations who helped people through the pandemic but have also fared well through the pandemic? Well, the checks and balances done to any scheme is brought forward are done by officials in the department. Uh, the question that you pose is whether the Department of the Economy have the ability to try and ensure that that money is spent in certain uh, business premises and not spent in others. Uh, and that obviously is a question for the Department of the Economy. I'm not certain that that can be done. Uh, with such a scheme, but that's why I went out yesterday and I will encourage, and I do encourage, and I expect all executive ministers to encourage people to shop locally, not just with this scheme, but over the whole Christmas period and into the future, because it's our local economy that needs support. But the question of how uh, the, the scheme would differentiate uh, between, and that's not to do with due diligence, that's to do with a policy matter if you're deciding that the scheme will pay it to certain businesses but will be barred from paying it to other businesses, is a matter of policy for the Department of Economy, not a matter of due diligence. Ms. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, 
I am sure the Minister will understand that many local businesses, and I think of towns in my own constituency like Warren Point Kilkale with Ryland, and those local small businesses who have been described as non-essential, and yet they are vital to our local economy, they will not be heartened to, say, uh, to find that no due diligence has happened ahead of that announcement. And I would urge the Minister to put in, put in place strategies that will reach those vital businesses to keep their doors open going into 2021. Well, it's, it's incorrect. I think for myself to answer a question to say it's not a matter of due diligence, it's a matter of policy for the Department of the Economy as to how to target that and then you to respond and say that no due diligence has been done. Due diligence has been done in this scheme as I have said, uh, but it's a matter of policy if the Department of the Economy want to use that scheme to direct it toward, away from what you would describe as multinational businesses and into the local economy. Of course we want to support the local economy. And that's why the schemes we brought forward are to support local businesses. That's why the executive is encouraging people to shop local uh, and to support our local businesses. That's why the, the schemes that we've been talking about earlier, in terms of those being rolled out, have been directed at the small and medium enterprises to try and give them that level of support. And that's been consistent right through the course of the pandemic. Ms. Joanne Bunting isn't in her place. I call Ms. Karen Mullen. Minister, can I ask how many businesses in Derry applied for the business support grant specific to the Derry and Strabane Council area? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the member will, uh, will know that the, the uh, Derry uh, and uh, businesses have been closed down for much longer than anyone else uh, and obviously have been suffering that. I, I think uh, from my own uh, latest figures I got, and, and these I think were yesterday, that we were up on over 70 per cent of businesses had, had received the support that they had applied for. And of course that scheme will be rolled on now. It was changed midstream to add additional businesses in from the original hospitality business and now it has been rolled on for further weeks. So I want to see that money being paid out as quickly as possible and get to the people uh, who need it very much on the ground in Derry and Strabane over the coming weeks. Ms Mullen. Sir, I thank you for your response so far and the support that you have given to local businesses in my area. Um, I suppose it's at this stage, if you could give us an answer in relation to how many have received the initial payment and subsequent payments as the weeks have rolled on. Well, as I say, the initial payment was for a smaller number of businesses. And, uh, we increased the, the payment level and, of course, the payment level to businesses in Derry had to be up as well because, if you remember, the original uh, lockdown restriction phase of this was for Derry City and Strabane Council area only uh, and then the, the level of payment was increased and, of course, that had to be retrospective payment to some of those who had already received at the lower level. So it has been quite complex and complicated in relation to that, but, of course, the objective has been to get that payment up to the right level and out as quickly as we can and recognise that we now have another couple of weeks to go in relation that. And bear in mind, all of these things have changed midstream from the original programme we designed. Other decisions come forward, which actually altered that decisions come forward in terms of the amount of money available to us, in terms of additional restrictions, and now additional time of those restrictions have all come in subsequently. So it is a matter of trying to catch up with the decisions that have been taken by other executive departments. Mr. Paul Given. Thank you, Principal De uh, Deputy Speaker. It will come as a shock, I believe, to the public that around half of all applicants that are eligible are still waiting to get a payment from this department that you, Minister, are responsible for, from LPS. Some weeks later from the scheme was announced in a fanfare, approximately in a crude assessment, at least £20 million sitting in your coffers still to get paid out, given that that's the figure that has been paid so far to around half of eligible ones. Is it not an indictment upon your department that these businesses that need this support still haven't got it? Well, firstly, as I've said, the, the schemes not only have changed in terms of their scope, they've changed in terms of the level of payment, uh, and we've been catching that up. Now, I, I want to see them done quicker. I want to see the rest of those schemes paid out tomorrow, if possible, or certainly in the next number of days, so that all of that money is out where it needs to be. I have to say, if you compare that to the other departments, and I think I put a chart up, you'll find that this scheme is paid out much more quickly and much more favourably than any of the other departments. Mr. Given. Minister, that, that's exactly the point. You and your colleagues have been incredibly quick to point the finger at other departments, and yet the department that you preside over has been failing to get this scheme paid out for. But the public want to see the money paid out, and those businesses need it. 
In terms of how the rates base going forward is going to be calculated, we have increased vacancies in terms of our high street. We have got pressures on our public finances. Is there a review taking place as to how there will be a fair share in terms of the burden upon the public purse spread across everyone in society for the next financial year? Well, can I say, firstly, I haven't been pointing the finger at anyone. I've been encouraging people to do schemes as quickly as they can and encouraging my own department to do likewise. Uh, and I'm not interested in the point scoring uh, that the member refers to. Uh, to be quite honest, I'm interested in getting support out onto the ground uh, as quickly as we can. He will have noticed in the announcement yesterday uh, that I had, uh, uh, the executive have agreed to set aside $150 million for further rates interventions uh, in the first half of the next financial year. And I think those are vital. That's consistently what we've been hearing uh, from business. So if we uh, can and get that scheme done and get that rates intervention done, then I think that will be of great assistance. Uh, and of course, it has to be done uh, by fairness, absolutely, uh, and I'm delighted that one of the side effects of this pandemic has been the DUP discovering socialism and fairness uh, for all people. Ms Linda Dillon. I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the Minister how many vacancies in the civil service have been filled by the most recent recruitment drive? Uh, well, they, I haven't got the actual figures for them, but the recruitment drive has been ongoing, uh, of course, uh, at all levels in the civil service, and uh, clearly there are a significant number of vacancies at the lower levels, and that's why we've been encouraging people who are currently employed by agencies uh, to apply for those, and we've improved uh, the, uh, the terms and conditions of those agency workers who have been working for quite some time, particularly in, in, in departments like communities uh, over some time. So there is an ongoing drive uh, to that. I think one of the areas that our review of civil service and, and, and for reform of civil service is a look at the age profile uh, in that, and I think it's quite clear that we need uh, a much younger cohort of people coming into the civil service, an influx of new ideas and new talent. Uh, but that has to be achieved through a managed way, and of course that will be uh, done through recruitment uh, over the course of the time ahead. Ms Dillon. Speaking as somebody who once worked in the lower levels of the civil service and knows what the pay was like at that level, I just want to commend many of our civil servants that are working at that level, trying to deliver on all of these schemes that have been talked about by, by all of us members in this chamber today, and it's not an easy job to do. Can the Minister outline, given the, the recent Audit Office report on the capacity and capability of the civil service, do you agree that we now have an urgent need for a review? And I know you've outlined that obviously we need to look at the, the age profile, but I think we also need to look at what we're asking of some of our civil servants for the pay that they get. Well, I think there are a range of matters there in that. There, one is, I, I think, the, the age profile and that, that ability to re recruit a younger cohort. There's also questions about the level at which people come into the civil service and the, the, the skills and experiences that they bring in uh, to that. There's questions in terms of people's ability to recruit from other jurisdictions into the civil service and the experience they can bring from working in other jurisdictions as well. So these are all key questions which I think uh, haven't really been addressed in, in previous uh, reviews. Uh, into civil service and, and the practices there. And I think uh, RHI highlighted a number of those, but it's not just because of that. I think there has been an impetus, and there, there should be an impetus, uh, which uh, led to an agreement among all of the executive parties for a need for a fundamental review of the civil service, uh, and that's what we intend to do. I think we have time for one question from Mr McCrossan and one answer from the Minister. Mr McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, given the pressure that businesses face, is it your expectation that the Reval 2020 will continue or will, will go on? Yes, I, I think there are a number of exercises to do with rates. One of them, which we wanted to try and address very quickly, was the ability to continue on with a, a, a rates relief, rates holiday for some businesses uh, going into the new financial year, because clearly there are the reval exercises, the rates exercise, and, uh, and then responding to the pandemic in the middle of all that. And, and a lot of people will not have, I suppose, recognised that in the last year's budget, we did a very effective uh, reduction in terms of commercial rates down almost the effect of 18%, uh, which is something that uh, businesses have been asking for. Uh, and so we continue to do that work, but obviously we're also trying to respond to the pandemic, and that's why the focus has been on trying to get, secure that additional money to take for the rates intervention in the early part of the next financial year. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to point of order, Mr. Wells. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, either the Minister of Finance 
has got the gift of prophecy, has a crystal ball, or there's collusion going on here. Because I noticed on the questions on marriage and on the payments in Londonderry, the minister had turned to the answer before the questions had finished and had turned to the answer for the supplementary before they'd been asked. Now, I understand that topical questions are meant to test the minister's mettle and find out if he's on top of his brief. Could it be, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that members of his party have been giving him the text of the questions in advance before they're asked? And is that in order for topical questions? The member has been here a lot longer than I have since 1998, and I'm sure the member would accept that such behind-the-scenes chicanery would never occur in an institution such as this. Uh, Minister. I, was, I did, in, in, in fact, do, did turn to see could I find figures for Derry, and I hadn't got them in my folder, so it disproves entirely your point. It disproves your point that the question was set up in the first place because I hadn't got actually the figures for it. If members would just take their ease for a moment, we'll return to the consideration stage of the functioning of government, miscellaneous, miscellaneous provisions bill, and if leaving the chamber you could uh, wipe down the surface that you were at as well. Thank you.